Welcome to the lecture on cell behaviors and models, an important precursor to BMS algorithms. And thank you for joining me on the path to sustainable energy. To understand battery management, we need a basic understanding of some cell behaviors. In this lecture, we will scratch the surface of the topic. We'll overview briefly some terminology, OCV or open circuit voltage, cell impedance, time-dependent responses, and aging. By the end of this lesson, you should understand these phenomena well enough to design BMS hardware. For each topic, we will look at cell data and apply it to a cell model. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to look at current and voltage measurements from a cell and explain the relationship between the model and the data. Lastly, I'll refer you to more learning resources if you want to go deeper on cell behavior and modeling. Let's start with terminology. Imagine a cell with a 5 amp hour total capacity. That means it can store 5 amp hours of charge. Imagine we charge it with 3 amp hours. We've put in 60% as much charge as it can hold. Its state of charge, or SOC, is now 60%. Imagine a second cell with slightly larger capacity, 5.5 amp hours. Let's charge that cell to the same state of charge to 60%. 60% of 5.5 amp hours is 3.3 amp hours. These cells are at the same state of charge, 60%, but they are holding different amounts of charge, 3 amp hours versus 3.3 amp hours. The amount of available charge in a cell is called the residual discharge capacity. It is how many amp hours we can pull out by discharging. There is also a term for how many amp hours we can put into the battery by charging, how far we are from fully charged. Residual charge capacity. Sometimes you will hear people referring to capacity and amp hours and state of charge in percent interchangeably. You can do that for cells of equal capacity. But as you can see for the yellow and purple cells in this example, when cells are not identical, a given state of charge maps to different residual capacities for the two cells. To summarize, capacity refers to the amount of charge in charge measuring units like amp hours or coulombs. Amp hours are more common in industry, but you'll see coulombs in scientific publications. SOC, or state of charge, refers to how charged the battery is as a fraction in percent. And one last term. Nominal capacity is the amount of charge a battery can supply to a load or can discharge when the cell is new, not aged. We reviewed the parts of a battery in the introductory lecture. If you missed it, pause the video and familiarize yourself with the labeled parts. Now, let's talk cell behaviors, starting with OCV, open circuit voltage. OCV stands for open circuit voltage. That is, the cell voltage when the cell is open or disconnected from any circuit. You will hear the acronym OCV a lot when working with battery management or algorithms. In some situations, the terminal voltage equals OCV. When no current is flowing and the cell is well rested, terminal voltage closely approximates OCV. Terminal voltage is what we can measure. OCV is the ideal voltage inside the cell. OCV is a function of state of charge. In this plot, OCV is on the y-axis and state of charge is on the x-axis. Indeed, OCV is key to state of charge estimation. OCV is our ground truth. We'll talk about that more in the lecture on SOC estimation algorithms. OCV does not include the instantaneous IR drop due to current flow, nor various time-dependent effects that we'll discuss in a few slides. OCV is also a function of temperature. Correspondingly, for good state of charge estimation, a BMS should measure cell temperatures. Many battery management systems have only a few temperature sensors for an entire battery pack, and careful mechanical design and characterization guides the locations of these temperature sensors to ensure that the BMS knows the lowest, highest, and typical temperatures across the battery pack. Hysteresis is the difference between OCV curves in charge versus in discharge. 
Let's see what that looks like on a plot. The y-axis is cell voltage, and the x-axis is state of charge, with 100% SOC on the left, which might look funny since the previous slide had the x-axis the other way. The black curve shows the OCV for charging, and red for discharging. So as we charge, the voltage will follow the black curve, and as we discharge, it will follow the red curve. Let's pause for a moment to get clear on what OCV during charging means, given that OCV is a measurement with no current flowing. For every point on the black charge curve, you would apply current to charge the cell, then stop the current and allow the cell to rest, and lastly measure the voltage of the rested cell with no current flowing. Let's go back to the plot. Notice the difference between the red and black curves. For a given state of charge, you will measure a slightly different open circuit voltage if you reach that SOC by charging than if you reached it by discharging. The difference between those two OCVs is the hysteresis. Note that the hysteresis varies. Hysteresis changes as state of charge changes. To summarize the key points, OCV is a function of state of charge, OCV is a function of temperature, OCV is subject to hysteresis, and OCV is key to state of charge estimation. As a side note, SOC and temperature dependencies are much larger than hysteresis. You can manage a battery safely without accounting for hysteresis, though your range predictions may be affected especially mid-range, where hysteresis is largest. Next, we'll move on to cell impedance. Nearly everything has impedance, and cells do too. If you pull a large current out of a cell, its voltage will instantaneously droop, and we can model that with a series resistor. This is one way in which OCV differs from the terminal voltage that we can measure. Let's do an example. Imagine a current load. 4.2 volts is a typical OCV for a fully charged NMC cell. Assume a 15 milliohm cell impedance, realistic for a single cylindrical cell. Now, calculate the terminal voltage from the OCV minus the IR drop across the cell impedance. The terminal voltage is 135 millivolts lower than the OCV in this scenario. Let's look at some data from real cells. This curve is similar to what we saw in the previous slides, voltage as a function of state of charge. And here is how the terminal voltage changes with current. As we apply successively larger currents, the curves shift downwards. The terminal voltage is lower with larger current load, just like in our IR drop calculation. R0 models the electrolyte resistance plus contact resistance. The electrolyte is the medium through which lithium ions flow inside a cell, the stuff between the electrodes. Contacts are how we connect to the electrodes, and any interface where two materials connect has some resistance. The next question is, how well does modeling cell impedance as a single resistor match reality? If we take the red curve and shift it down linearly, as this model would have us do, we can see that the calculated dotted curves don't quite match the shape of the measured solid curves, but they're close over much of the operating range. Just to be clear, the solid lines are measured data. The dotted lines are calculated starting with the red curve and applying a simple IR drop as in the schematic on the left. The difference between the measured solid lines and the model dotted lines is our modeling error. All models have some error. If this residual error is too much for a given application, we need a more sophisticated model. Next, we'll discuss time-dependent behaviors of a lithium-ion battery cell. The model we have so far incorporates no delays, no memory, no, no time... <laughs> the model we have so far incorporates no delays, no memory, no time-dependence. In reality, 
the time-dependent responses of cells are actually significant. Let's look at how cells behave first, and secondly, update the model. On the top plot, we have a cell voltage as a function of time. On the bottom plot, we have current as a function of time. What we see here is a nearly fully charged NMC cell subjected to a current pulse. Let's first look at the effects we've already studied. Some of the decrease in voltage during the current pulse comes from the cell discharging, the OCV dropping as the state of charge drops. Much of the initial step change is due to the IR drop from the cell impedance that we've modeled as R0. With 700 millivolt drop due to a nearly 6 amp current pulse, we can estimate that this cell's impedance is about 120 milliohm. But we also see these gentle curves and very gradual relaxation after the current has stopped. It takes a long time for the cell to settle to a constant voltage after a current pulse. This is due to slow diffusion processes in the cell. The slow settling is called depolarization or voltage equilibration. We can model these time-dependent processes with a resistor in parallel with a capacitor. If the circuit is familiar to you, then it may be obvious to you that the shape of the gradual relaxation in the plot is shaped like the behavior of the parallel RC circuit. If you're rusty on RC circuits, either work through the math yourself, or install LTSpice and run a simulation, or watch a tutorial. For example, on YouTube, Physics Ninja has a nice tutorial entitled Parallel RC Circuit. Our newly added C1 and R1 have names. C1 is the double layer capacitance and models charge bu charges building up at the interface of the electrolyte and the electrode particles. R1 is named charge transfer resistance and models the voltage drop over the electrode electrolyte interface due to a load. There are actually a variety of models implementing this concept. They vary in how precisely they reflect the actual physics and in how easy they are to implement computationally. Remember, most battery management systems run on some embedded microcontroller with limited computational power. The Randall's circuit adds a frequency-dependent impedance, the Warburg impedance. You can find claims that the components in the circuit correspond to physical processes and publications questioning that assumption. In any case, the Warburg impedance cannot be represented with a simple differential equation, so it is hard to implement directly in code. I won't be quizzing you on the details of the Randall circuit, but I would like you to glimpse the math and rigor possible with cell modeling. A computationally simpler model includes a stack of parallel RCs. While infinitely many of these RC pairs would be required to exactly equal the Warburg impedance, in practice, a small number is good enough for practical purposes. One or two RCs often suffice for production systems. Now, we'll discuss cell aging. Aging and state of health estimation go together. Aging occurs due to calendar time and is accelerated by high temperatures, high currents, and high state of charge. It affects the cell impedances and total capacity. An aged cell can also be more susceptible to failure, including exothermic behavior. Aging is reflected in the cell model as a decrease in total capacity, increased electrolyte and contact impedance, and increased resistances in the RC pairs due to increasing charge transfer resistance and SCI growth. We haven't talked about SCI, which stands for Solid Electrolyte Interphase, and is a thin film on the anode composed of various lithium compounds reduced from the electrolyte. To boil down the key ideas here, aging is evidenced by decreased capacity and increased cell impedance. The term state of health, or SOH, doesn't have a single consistent definition, and I've heard it used quantitatively to refer to capacity fade, and qualitatively to refer to impedance increase. A common equation for state of health ignores cell impedance and is quite simply the present capacity divided by the nominal capacity. On the iconic plot of voltage versus capacity, this is how the curve shifts from a new cell to an aged cell. 
we'll look at plots from a publication that really nicely shows capacity loss in the three chemistries most common in electric cars. We have NCA, which is what Tesla uses for its performance cars. We have NMC, which is what most major car manufacturers use. And we have LFP, which has lower energy density, but less propensity for exothermic behavior, and is gaining popularity for electric cars in the last couple years. There's a lot of data here, so let's start by dissecting just one of these plots, and we'll return to the other two later. This data is all for 10 months of aging. Let's look at how state of charge affects aging. State of charge, or SOC, is on the x-axis. The researchers charged cells to 16 different states of charge and left them at that state of charge for 10 months. State of charge is directly related to voltage. In the plot on the right, you can see the correspondence between voltage on the y-axis and residual capacity on the x-axis for three different cell chemistries, including NCA. 0% SOC is on the left, and 100% SOC is on the right. NCA cells stored at 100% SOC, which is 4.2 volts, degraded to about 96% of their initial capacity over the 10 months of storage. Cells stored at 50% SOC degraded less, and cells stored, at, stored nearly discharged near 3 volts degraded the least. Aging accelerates with state of charge. Now let's look at the impact of temperature on aging. We can see that the cell capacity degrades faster at hotter temperature. At 25 C, room temperature, these cells degraded to 96% of their initial capacity. At 40 C to 91%, at 50 C to 87%. Aging accelerates with temperature. As a side note, the cells used in this study are not as good as those in my Tesla. My car suffers far less than 4% per year capacity loss. Let's look at a real world example. Shortly after the Nissan Leaf came out, some owners in Arizona started reporting unexpectedly large capacity loss, loss of one of the 12 bars of range within the first year. Nissan initially claimed this was a dashboard instrumentation problem, but a group of LEAF owners performed controlled range tests confirming actual range loss. Maybe you've heard about this, but if not, take a moment to think about what's special about Phoenix, Arizona. What mechanical engineering decision could explain why Nissan LEAFs in Phoenix suffered unusually large capacity loss? Unlike most electric cars, the early version of the LEAF used air cooling for the battery. Most electric cars use liquid cooling. The high temperatures in Phoenix, combined with insufficient cooling, led to capacity degradation exceeding what Nissan advertised. Now let's go back to that data and look at differences between chemistries. Pause the video to look at the plots yourself and draw your own conclusions before hearing my observations. The first thing that jumps out at me is that NMC is more sensitive to high state of charge than the other two. The second thing that I notice is that at 25 degrees C, all three chemistries age nearly identically, which is good. That suggests that with good thermal and electrical management, any of these chemistries could provide good performance. Third, I notice that NMC is most sensitive to high temperature. If we look at the data points for 80% to 90% SOC, circled in orange, we can see that the NCA and LFP cells show similar degradation at 50 degrees C, while NMC cells lost substantially more capacity. Aging also affects cell impedance. Do you remember when cell impedance matters? Cell impedance matters when current is flowing into or out of a battery. With a load current applied to the battery, the cell's internal impedance results in a voltage drop, I times R. For every cell, the manufacturer defines some minimum operating voltage at which we stop discharge. Notice what happens here. 
Due to cell impedance, when we have a current load, we reach that minimum operating voltage before the cell is fully discharged. We cannot use that last bit of capacity at our typical load current, and either need to accept that capacity loss or reduce the current as we approach 0% SOC. The more aged a cell is, the higher its impedance and the larger this effect. Now, let's look at some aging data illustrating how both capacity and impedance degrade. It's from a data brief, a short publication from the University of Alabama. They measured the aging of a cylindrical cell. We'll discuss the test setup first, then what we can learn from this data, and lastly, what I don't like about it. The researchers cycled a lithium ion cell, meaning they repeatedly charged it to full and then discharged it to empty, and they assessed capacity and internal resistance every 30 cycles. From the 3.7 volt nominal voltage listed in the data sheet, we know they used an NMC or similar cell, not LFP. The authors charged and discharged the cell at 1C. Let's look at the plot now. The x-axis is the number of cycles. The left y-axis is state of health, which the authors defined as the available capacity divided by the nominal capacity. St SOH measurements are plotted as the purple curve, and we see capacity decreasing as the cell is cycled. That's the trend we expect. The right y-axis shows the DC impedance, with the data plotted in green, red, and blue. The cell impedance increases with cycling. Again, the trend we expect. Great. The claims I made about aging are consistent with data. Now, here's what I don't like about this data set. The cell degrades really quickly. The data sheet claims a cycle life of 300 cycles, defined as is customary as at least 80% capacity at that point. The data, in contrast, shows 80% capacity after only 90 cycles. Aging over three times faster than expected makes me wonder what's wrong. Possibly, the cell supplier has manufacturing issues. Possibly, there's something funny about the experimental setup. Details can matter. The data sheet defines this cell's cycle life with a half C charge rate and one C discharge rate. The researchers used one C for both, in effect, charging at double the recommended rate. While this may not be ideal data, it does clearly illustrate that aging causes a decrease in capacity and an increase in cell impedance. Lastly, I'd like to point you at another learning resource. My course is focused on hardware, including systems engineering, design for safety, intuition, and data analysis. Professor Gregory Plutt at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs also offers a course on battery management, available on his university website or on Coursera. I'm teaching you what you need to know to design good hardware. Professor Plett teaches what you need to know to design good software. I think the two courses complement each other nicely, with some overlap. So, for a more rigorous dive into the mathematics around cell modeling, take a look at Professor Plett's handouts or video lectures. This completes the lecture on cell behavior and models in my battery management systems course. Thank you for joining me on the path to sustainable energy.